everyone, my name is Clancis and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So first things first, I just want to wish everybody who celebrates Christmas a Merry Christmas and may all of your families and friends as well as yourself walk into 2022 filled with blessings, filled with happiness and love and of course abundance of blessings. If you do not celebrate Christmas, I wish you the same as well. So there are some few things that I want to address before I start on today's case. So guys, my channel in 2022 is going to undergo some kind of changes here and there. It's not going to be major changes. So I don't know if you know that I film all my videos using my cell phone. So I am trying to save up for a camera. I'm also trying to save up for an editor. I'm also trying to save up for other things as well to improve my channel as well as my presentation on this channel. I have seen and noted some of you guys' um, suggestions and recommendations on how I can improve my channel and I highly appreciate that because this means that you guys really care about me as much as I care about you. And the last thing that I also want to say in this channel is to warmly welcome each and every one of you for coming to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So I see some people think that I strategically went to coffee house crimes as well as other big uh, true crime YouTubers where I kind of like self-promoted myself. Well, the truth of the matter is I was innocently... Uh, commenting on Coffee House Crime when he covered the story of Rosemary Ndlovu, whom I have covered in my own channel about three weeks before he uploaded a similar story. So I was just sharing with him that, hey, I also covered the same story. And for that reason, many of you came from Coffee House Crime and subscribed to my channel. And I must confess, for a whole week, I felt so terribly guilty because it felt as though I was self-promoting my channel onto his channel. So I realized that the true crime community is huge and a lot of people love true crime stories coming from everywhere around the world. So my true crime channel basically focuses on true crime in South Africa. Yes, I am going to branch out to other countries as well if I find a case that fascinates me and I would like to share on my channel. But I am so grateful for you to be here and, and definitely I will give you the best of the best of cases that I am working on for 2022. So the last, last, last thing that I want to mention, guys, in South Africa, December is not just a month and it's just not a month for Christmas and the new year and things of that nature. In South Africa, December is a whole event. So as of the 16th of December, which is a public holiday here in South Africa called the Day of Reconciliation. So it basically our festive season officially kickstarts from the 16th. So for some time I have been really busy at work. So I was not keeping up with the times. I kind of like forgot that I was having families coming from all over the country uh, to start preparing for Christmas and all that sort of celebrations. So as a result, I found myself struggling with filming, struggling with research, struggling with editing my videos because editing takes a lot of time. Filming a video takes about two to three hours for me, but editing, yeah, that is where the hard work is at. So I found myself really pushed against the corner and I needed to upload a video. The one that I uploaded on Tuesday was supposed to have gone up on Sunday because I upload every Sundays at five o'clock South African time. So as a result, I thought, you know what, let me give you guys the best stories presented the best way. So let me say that this video that I'm going to be doing today is going to be the last one in 2021. So I will start all over again in 2022 where I will have some really great stories that I would like to share with you on this channel. True crime stories, that is what I mean. And hopefully the channel will continue to grow as much as it is growing. And I am loving it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May you all be blessed equally. 
So some of you even discovered that I have a second channel. Basically, that second channel is my main channel. This is where I teach or I give tips, tricks and hacks on how to grow your YouTube channel. So that channel just speaks about all things YouTube. It's called The Real Clancy's Tutorials. I hope I'm going to leave the name on the screen here in case you want to go and check that channel out. I will highly appreciate that. So some of you did come to my DM Instagram where you were suggesting uh, ideas on how I can raise funds to buy a camera as well as other equipment that I will need to improve my channel. So one of the suggestion or the one of the common suggestion was that I create my own Patreon account where I'm going to have like monthly subscriptions and that way I will get people coming in and subscribing uh, to my Patreon account and as a result I'll be able to raise some funds in order to buy myself a camera and other equipment that I will need to improve the quality of my videos as well as my storytelling. So I discovered when you open a Patreon account you will have to have other activities outside of the channel that you will have to do on your Patreon. So one of the things that was suggested was that before I upload on Sunday, I give my Patreon subscribers an early access of my videos before they go on on Sunday. So there are other things as well that I am willing to hear from you guys. What would you like to see behind the scenes uh, regarding my Patreon account? And that way I will give you the best of the best of me or oh, basically we just talk and have fun you guys getting to know me because this sort of channel I don't think it will necessarily give me that opportunity for you to get to know me it's not like all the other niches on YouTube where you will have a video where you actually get people to know you I think at some stage I may create such a video but I think such a video will be great to have on my patreon account so please do let me know do you think I should create a patreon account if I do do you think you guys will be able to subscribe and if you do subscribe what would you like to see from me on my patreon so please do comment down below and let me know because I thought that is a great way of um, of raising funds to improve my YouTube channel I really am desperate to buy a camera as well as a laptop because what I'm using currently now is very limiting one of the things that I cannot do from my cell phone is download news clips as well as other videos that I can insert in my stories that I tell so that you guys get to see other perspective from the media or maybe other sort of stuff so I would highly appreciate that and I uh, think that is it regarding my plans for this channel in 2022. Yes, I am also going to have some affiliate links that are going to be embedded in my description box. And that is another way that I can raise some funds so I will be able to buy a camera and other equipment for my channel. Anyway, thank you guys for listening to this ramp. So without further ado, let's get into today's case. So today's case is about Mokozi Freddy Mulawodzi, also known as the Limpopo serial killer. So Mokozi Freddy Mulawodzi was born in 1962. This is another one that I am hoping is not a cancer because I could not find his full birthday. So I'm going to call him Freddy throughout the video because I think his names are way too long. So anyway, so Freddy was born in a village called Madala in Tohoyando, Limpopo, South Africa. So Limpopo is one of South Africa's nine provinces. It is situated on the northern part of South Africa and the province harbors about three tribes, which is Bapedi, Bavenda, as well as Tsonga. And outside of those three tribes, you will also find white people known as Afrikaners. And there are also some English people that are living in Limpopo. Usually Limpopo province is a farming province. Yes, there are other economic activities that take place there, but mostly it is a farming province. Now, Tohoyando is a capital city of Venda. Now, Venda, it is where my favorite people live because they are the most humble people, very smart, successful, and educated 
in South Africa. They are known as Bavenda. And I happen to also love the language. It's one of the most difficult languages to learn in South Africa, but it is beautiful. I call it South Africa's French. The Venda people speaks a language called Chivenda. So back to Freddy. Freddy was born into poverty. Unfortunately, there's not much I found about Freddy except for little bits and pieces of his background or childhood that maybe he had said something to the police or his fellow or his fellow cellmate or maybe people that knew him. So, like I said, he was born into poverty, was born to a single mother. Though his father was alive during his upbringing, but he was just absent. He just he did not acknowledge Freddy whatsoever. Well, in most villages in South Africa, it takes a village to raise a child. So even though Freddy would not have food at home, he always knew that he was going to get food elsewhere as long as he had neighbors, though the neighbors themselves had economic difficulties in their own families when it came to food supply. Now, Venda has a very lush and fertile soil, so many Bavenda people lived off the land. I suspect that Freddie's mother also had like her own uh, had her own fruit and veg garden that uh, she would feed Freddie from. Unfortunately, Freddie was not fond of school. He would attend school, but he would also not attend school. So most of the time he dodged school. If he did go to school, he would leave during recess. However, Freddie eventually dropped out of school. And when he did drop out of school in the early 80s, he was 18 years old and he was still in the fourth grade. Now, I don't understand how an 18 year old is still in the fourth grade, but I guess because under Bantu education back in the 80s, maybe some pupils or students did not see any prospect with their own life. So they did not see the point of going to school when going to school would still lead them to becoming like cheap laborers and still be subjected to a life of poverty. So it is safe to say that Freddie was illiterate. But for some reason, he was quite smart too. Just like all the serial killers that I have covered in this channel, all of them seem to have some sort of high IQ or intelligence because this one was pretty good in evading the law. So like I said, I could not find any more information about Freddie Mulawudzi because he refused to talk about his upbringing, his childhood. He refused to talk about his background altogether, despite psychologists as well as prison wardens tried to speak to him to open about his life but he would not say anything. So I guess this is where his background ends. So in 1985, Freddie decided to live a life of crime. He decided to involve himself in some petty crimes. Basically, I think in America it's called misdemeanors. So basically, there are crimes that will not necessarily get you like heavy sentences. In his case, he was once caught and then he was arrested, taken to court, and the court sentenced him to a 120 rand fine or four months in prison. Somehow his mother was able to raise the 120 rand and pay the fine and off he went free and continued to become a petty criminal. So one of the things that I did not quite understand about his mother was the fact that Freddy was bringing things to the house just so they will have food on the table. And she never wants to question him, where do you get the money to get all these things? I guess some parents decided to just bury their heads in the sand as long as they get food to eat every single night. So Freddie decided to up his ante and basically started committing some serious crimes. That in 1990, Freddie was brought before a court for charges of robbery and two murders of unnamed people to this very day. Unfortunately, I did try to check and find who these people were that he, that he had murdered. On records, it just says that he had robbed them. After robbing them, he murdered them. That is all. What their names were, where they came from, who they were, nothing. So in 1991, Freddie was found guilty for the murder of two people and aggravated robbery. And he was sentenced to two life sentences. So you would think this is the end of Mukozi Freddy Mulawudzi's case, 
Well, far from it, because Freddie in 1996 decided to escape from prison in Pretoria. No, it was not a CMEX prison. It was some prison called Pretoria Bovian Port Prison. I think it was a normal medium B prison. Now, a medium B prison, it is not a prison where you would find your hardcore criminals. I don't understand why he was not taken to a CMEX. After all, he was serving two life sentences for killing two innocent people that he had robbed. I think the state there kind of like failed the people of Pretoria and South Africa as a whole because he was supposed to have gone to a CMAX. Well, it turned out that Freddy was quite smart. He was able to figure out this prison and he managed to escape in 1996. So a manhunt was executed trying to find where exactly did Freddy Mulawudzi had run to. They searched for him absolutely everywhere around the country. APBs were put in place. All kinds of um, warnings and alertments that were put to the public that if they ever came across him, number one, they should not approach him because he's extremely dangerous. And secondly, if they do see him, they should call a certain number that was designated for the public to call the police so that they can come and make an arrest. However, Freddie Mulawudzi seemed to have just waltzed out of Bovian Port Prison and he disappeared into thin air. So by 2004, Freddie Mulawudzi was still on the run and the police had no idea where to find him. So this is the part I'm trying to understand as well. How is it possible that a hardcore criminal, a murderer, will simply waltz out of prison and then walks into thin air and disappears for eight years? And in the eight years, it is said that there were no crimes that were committed that linked Freddie, which I also find a little bit difficult to understand because Freddie was uneducated and therefore he did not have any means of income if he did not have some sort of tertiary education or qualification. Because in 2004 into 2006, South Africa, if you wanted a well-paying job, you needed to go to university, acquire a degree, and then go and find a well-paying job. If you did not go to school or did not go to university, you either became an entrepreneur by basic, probably by establishing a small medium enterprise and become successful there because that's what many people who did not have the opportunity to go to university did. But with Freddie Mulawudzi, there were no records of any sort of what, of how he was living his life on the run. So I sincerely believe that he may have committed more crimes and he may have murdered more people in order for him to live or basically have money to rent wherever he was staying, have food, have clothes on his back, and probably uh, going around with the ladies because all that required money. However, I also do get it. Now, remember from 2001 to about 2007, there were other serial killers that were on the loose. Some of them I've already covered in this channel. But let me remind you, there was Ananias Mate, there was Moses Sitole, there was Cedric Marke, and there were also other serial killers that I have not covered in this channel yet that were busy killing people between 2001 and 2006. Perhaps the police had their hands full and they did not quite prioritize Freddy Mulawudzi trying to find him. They needed to solve these ones that they had at the moment because pressure on the police at the time was quite high. So Freddy decided to become extremely brave and come out of his hiding. In 2004, Freddy decided to return to Limpopo. There's absolutely nothing that said why he went back to Limpopo. I think, I think perhaps he was running away from Gauteng because he had committed some heinous crimes and thought maybe the police were on his trail. And so he decided to run back to Limpopo where he grew up basically into Hoyando where he met a woman and bravely married this woman by the name of Takalani Netengwa. They even had a baby boy together. After the birth of his son, Freddy decided to go on a rampage of terror in Tohoyando and around Limpopo. 
so i want to make a disclaimer guys from this point in the video i am going to be saying description of heinous crimes and description of violence where it involves the death of children or killing of children so if you think you are going to be triggered or maybe you'll be too sensitive to hear these uh to hear these descriptions please do click off and go watch something else like i said i do have another channel called the real clancy's tutorials you can go there and subscribe and then watch some of my videos i will highly appreciate that but if you think you can stomach what i'm about to say in this video then please do continue and do so with caution so in june of 2004 freddie decided to go and break into a house where he stole valuables fortunately in the house there was nobody because the occupants had gone to another province for a family funeral so after he was done stealing the valuables he left the house even with the doors opened and another thing that i also want to apologize about i am just going to say the names of the victims because their surnames are a little bit difficult to pronounce for me and i do not like butchering people's names and surnames and these names or surnames you most of them are in chivanda and like i said i love chivanda and i do not want to offend anybody by mispronouncing the surnames of some of these victims so i will just say the name of the victim and leave out the surname because i found it extremely difficult to pronounce their names so on the 29th of june 2004 freddie broke into the house of margaret where he attempted to murder her for her valuables however margaret put up a fight and she was never going to go down without defending herself and her properties fortunately for her freddy fled and he never came back to that house again so after attacking margaret's house freddy seemed to have disappeared off the scene for at least two to three months however freddy returned in september of 2004 where he broke into another house and stole their valuables so there are two suspicions that i have as to why he disappeared for two months i think maybe uh, margaret put up a fight and injured him and so he was busy nursing that injury or he was afraid that margaret did go to the police and gave a description again gave a description of him and thought maybe the police were on his heels and so he decided to lay low remember he is still a fugitive in the same september of 2004 freddie went and broke into another house where he found a woman asleep freddie decided to rape this woman but he did not kill her few days after breaking into the lady's house and raped her he broke into another house of rufuno and her brother's widow where he attempted to kill both the women but these two women they put up a fight and as a result freddy left without stealing anything again freddy went quiet for another month but he returned in november of 2004 freddy broke into a home where he found occupants in the house and he attempted to kill them all unfortunately he failed to kill these people and you guessed it he went quiet once again and this time he went quiet for a good six months so while freddy had gone quiet in the six months he did not commit any crimes he did not steal he did not murder he did not rape he seemed to have disappeared into thin air once again however on the 2nd of june 2005 freddy breaks into the house of Jeanette and marvel dharma so when he broke into the house marvel realized that there was a person or an intruder in their home when he went to investigate that is when he met with freddy who wasted no time and hacked him to death after killing marvel he went straight to Jeanette, where he also hacked her to death after he was done killing the couple he then robbed the house of everything that he found valuable in the house on the 4th of june 2005 he breaks into another house where he attempts to kill a woman that he found there unfortunately her name was unknown on the same day after he had attacked this unknown woman he then saw a police officer and he gathered up enough strength and bravado and went and attacked this officer and he stole his gun after he overpowered him 
Unfortunately, the service pistol was never recovered. On the 20th of August 2005, Freddy breaks into another home of Maria and Dakalo Munyai. The moment he got into the house, he murdered Maria and he attempted to kill Dakalo. However, Dakalo put up a fight and he was saved. So every time Freddy attempts to kill someone but they survive because they fought him off, he disappears. I think I'm quite correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. Every time he leaves a survivor, he always assumes that the survivor runs to the police and give a description of him. Remember, he's still a fugitive. And secondly, when you attempt to kill someone, that is a crime in South Africa. And of course, the police would have to investigate and try and find the perpetrator. So I think that's the reason why he disappears, because he hides. Which is why I strongly believe that when he did escape in 1994 from prison, he lived a life of crime. Hence, he returned to Limpopo. So this time, after killing Maria and attempted to kill Dakalo, he went quiet for a good year. So on the 4th of August 2006, Freddy breaks into the house of a single mother. He notices the woman laying in her bed. He proceeds to rape her. After raping her, he took out a knife that he always carried with him and began to stab her several times. So after stabbing Fofi several times, he then realized that Fofi had two children, one five-year-old and one seven-year-old. And guess what he does? He does the most horrendous thing to these two children. He takes out a match, he strikes it up and lit the house on fire, literally burning these two innocent children alive. So on the 19th of August 2006, Freddy breaks into the house of Sibungwana family, where he meets a 19-year-old lady who was sleeping on her bed. He proceeds to rape her. After raping her, he murders her. After murdering this 19-year-old girl, he then saw three young children. And these three children's ages range from 7, 10, and 14-year-olds. And guess what he proceeds to do? To murder them as well. And at this time, the police had caught wind of what was going on. And they were also under frenzy trying to find who this perpetrator was because clearly he was a danger to society in the province of Limpopo and they needed to catch him and they needed to catch him now before he killed more people. More people he did kill. The police decided to work with the police force investigative profiling unit where they basically sat down and decided to profile this killer. As they were collecting evidence, as they were collecting bodies, and as they were collecting all other clues that they could put together, one of the detectives realized that, no man, this sounds a little bit familiar. He thought he knew who this perpetrator was, but he needed to make sure that it was him by going and interviewing the survivors. In late August 2006, Freddie meets a woman by the name of Shonisani who was heavily pregnant. She was due to give birth soon. So when he meets her, he decides to murder her. After murdering her, he mutilated her body where he removed her right arm, her left ear, as well as parts of her lips. However, when the police found Shonisani's body, they were not sure if her body was mutilated before or after post-mortem. So eventually, one of the detectives, his name was Tyson again, I can't pronounce his surname. Uh, he figured it out that he thinks he knows who the serial killer was. And so he just needed to make sure one more time by collecting all the evidence in order for him to kind of like be confident that he knows exactly who the serial killer was. And he started going around the communities in Limpopo asking for eyewitnesses. And some eyewitnesses did come forward and they all said the same thing. It was Mokosi Freddy Mulawudzi who was killing all these people. Now, Detective Tyson wanted to know for sure because he too was suspecting exactly the same person. But he needed to ensure that he understood very well that it was Freddy who was committing all these heinous crimes. 
but the community whom some people knew who freddy was they all said it is freddy so by 2006, Freddie Mulawudzi was already celebrating his 10th year anniversary since a fugitive. Fortunately, Freddie's killing spree comes to an end with Shonisani's killing. Because few days after he had killed Shonisani and mutilated her body, Freddie was caught hiding in a broken fridge in his mother's house. So it was clear to him that the police were hot on his heel. Somebody must have notified him and said the police were looking for you. When the police got to Freddie Mulawutsi's home, they arrested his wife as well as his two friends for possession of stolen goods. Because when the police entered the house, they discovered stolen property that, that Freddie had stolen from all his victims. Or oh, just to make sure that you understand this in South Africa, police are not allowed to just walk into somebody's house and search it without a search warrant. The police would go to a high court and apply for a search warrant and the judge will grant it and that is when they are armed with a search warrant. So when they came to arrest Freddie, they were armed with a search warrant. That's why they were able to search his mother's house and basically recover all the stolen goods as part of the evidence that they were going to present in court so after freddy's arrest the media went on a frenzy they reported every single day and they had his face splashed all over the newspapers all over television unfortunately back then there was no social media however shonisani's son remember the pregnant woman came forward and said the police had the wrong man he believes that his father was the one that killed his mother mutilated her body for muti purposes now muti is actually like voodoo concoction of some sort I would make a video one day about what Muti is so that you get to understand what that is but in this video I don't have the time to do that but uh, just know that it's a voodoo sort of a uh, juju sort of thing that is done by traditional healers and uh, basically the naughty traditional healers that would use human body parts to create a concoction either for a client who wants to be rich or a client that wants somebody else dead or whatever the case might be which i still think this is just sick how do you get a human body part for you to be rich it so happened that shonisani's husband after her body was discovered he too was arrested but he was released because the dna showed or proved that he was not the man that had killed shonisani However, the DNA did link Freddie Mulawudzi to Shonisani's death, and hence he is carrying that charge of killing Shonisani. So when Freddie was taken to the police station and questioned about all these heinous crimes that he had committed, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He denied, denied, denied absolutely everything, and then he refused to talk. When he was taken to court, Freddie started behaving quite strangely. So on his first day of his trial or appearing in court, he decided to grab his toddler son from a woman that was carrying him. And then he grabbed him and said, I'm going to lay on the floor with this child until the police released my wife. Freddie was not happy that his wife was arrested. I'm assuming the reason why he was unhappy was because he thought that if the wife was out, she was able to, uh, to bail him out if he needed to apply for bail, which I think Freddie forgot one teensy wincy little bit detail that he had committed in 1996, escaping from prison while serving a two-life sentence. So I don't think that the court will actually release him on bail or maybe give him, or give him an opportunity to apply for bail when he's already a fugitive 
from two life sentences. So he was quite delusional. So the following day on his second court appearance, he then raised his hand and asked the judge if he could ask a question. So the judge was quite curious to know exactly what he had in mind. And that is when Freddie asked the court or the judge if the police were allowed to pay a bribe to an accused. The judge said, no, they are not allowed. He then proceeded to claim that the police had offered him a hundred thousand rand to plead guilty for all the charges that were leveled against him. Even if it's true, you are still a fugitive Freddy. You still have two life sentences that you have run away from. So whether the police did bribe you and gave you a hundred thousand rand, you are still going to jail to continue your two life sentences. So the that just doesn't make sense to me because the judge or the court will not just say, okay, here's the door, walk free, bye. He has to go back to jail. So every single day when Freddie came to court, the police seemed to always have another additional charges that they will add onto his docket because so many unsolved crimes, the police basically went and looked at them and they all linked to Freddie Mulawudzi and they would come every day and add and add and add and add onto his docket. So eventually Freddie was like, okay, fine, you got me. I admit that I did commit these sort of crimes. He admitted mostly to the petty crimes and stealing of property, but he refused to admit to the murders that he had committed. And during his trial, one of the things that the court found extremely difficult, especially the state, was the fact that even though they found stolen goods in the property of his mother, but the properties were still not linking Freddie to the crime, to the heinous crimes that he had committed. Secondly, he always broke into these houses at night, meaning that there will not be eyewitnesses that were able to point him out. So that made his trial, his trial was easy, but complicated, if I can put it that way. So on the 28th of August, 2008, Mukosi Freddy Mulawudzi was found guilty of all 28 charges leveled against him. And there were 11 counts of murder and he was sentenced to 11 life sentences plus 200 years in prison for all the other charges. And let's also not forget that he ran away from two life sentences. So when the judge, after sentencing him, this is what the judge decided. He said, Freddie will have to complete his first two life sentences. And at any point he became eligible for parole, then his 11 other sentences will kick in. So meaning that Freddie will never see the light of day in his life again. He will basically rot and die in prison deservedly so. So that is it guys about Mukosi Freddy Mulawudzi, also known as the Limpopo serial killer. So please do consider subscribing to my channel if you have not yet and do also click the bell notification so that you get notified of all my true crime uploads and also I will highly appreciate it if you gave this video a thumbs up and again do share this video far and wide. Don't forget to leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time with a new video in the new year and Merry Christmas to you. Goodbye.